a legendary investor himself, Foster Fries. Hi, Trent. Good to see you, Foster. It's a delight to be with Welcome. you. Welcome. It's good to see you in person. I mean, we've yes. spoken uh, yes. by remote before, right. but it's good to see you in it's person. Much better. Uh, on a day when the market's off 400 points, uh, what would you be telling clients right well, now? Well, uh, we would always tell our potential clients never invest in the stock market invest in individual businesses. So we don't spend a lot of time agonizing about interest rate trends, the economy. We want to buy companies that can do very well despite those factors. So we try to exclude those. And uh, I love the idea that the uh, stock market has predicted 10 of the last three recessions. Oh, it does. I mean, the, the stock market tends to run six to nine months ahead of what the real economy is doing. One the thing that has been peculiar about this economic malaise that we have been in is that the market has done as well as it has. Foster, how do you, how do you, how do you make sense of that, I, I that the market's that, so divorced from Yeah, I, I think it's because of a phony uh, uh, interest rate. With the interest rates kept down and all this money pouring in, where can the money go? I, I re remember uh, trying to raise cash as a money manager, and all the institutional clients resented that because they said, we hired you invest in a specific segment of the market will determine the cash position. Mm -hmm. When I started out, when I had a lot of individuals, they wanted me to go into cash. It's very hard now for big institutions to say, well, let's take our cash position up to 50%. They just can't do it. Mm -hmm. So when the money pours in, they have to buy. And so I think it's sort of an artificial stimulation that Obama has created through, through the, uh, the, the banking system. Mm -hmm. Through uh, the Fed. Uh, um, Fed yeah. Let's turn to something that, that one of the guests just said. Gus pointed out that, you know, look, 5.0% unemployment. So he is 200,000 uh, jobs yeah. a month being created. We're in a good economic spot. Well, I don't know if it's Gus, uh, the second guy, he said, wait, Gary, you, mm -hmm. Gary, he, Gary nailed it. He said, you know, when you take people out of the workforce, you could take the employment rate to 2%. Just take a whole bunch of people out of people seeking jobs. Who determines that? Well, well here's a question I have for you. I mean, how, how is it that someone that needs to take care of their family, needs to take care of themselves, can suddenly say, I'm not going to look for a job. Um, and so they're not counted anymore. I mean, how do you take yourself out of the workforce like that? Yeah, I, that's, that's what I, I think is such a smart question, because what is more important, the point that uh, Gary made, is what are the number of people who remove themselves from the workforce? And what is the percentage of the American people that are working? And what's the percentage of American people that aren't working? And where does this phony unemployment rate come up? It's a manufactured government number to make things look good. Is, is this in part because of government programs, though? I mean, the, 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 it's become okay to well, be able to not work in this economy? Well, I, I think the statistics, Rick Santorum in Wisconsin last year had someone tell him, if you're a single mom with two kids and uh, you make less than $15,000, you get government aid, food yeah. stamps, medical care, housing alliance, which is equivalent to, what, forty eight, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000? Yeah, no, I, I, I've looked at the numbers myself on yeah. this, and if you're a mom in Hawaii, a single mother of two, uh, you get about $60,000 yeah. in the equivalent of after-tax benefit. If you live in New Hampshire, yeah. first in the nation state, you're, you get about 38000 So a lot of these moms, I would argue, are making rational decisions. They're saying, okay, you know, I yeah. can effectively sit home with my kids, take care of them, and earn 60000 in Hawaii from the government. You know, maybe that's better yeah. than, than trying to take them to daycare and barely having any money left over. You know, this is something I asked Senator Santorum about last night. I asked about the family and single motherhood yeah. and the fact that so many babies now are being born to single moms. Yeah. Let's show you that clip right here and you can sure. hear his response. Sure. From a policy perspective, should the government be doing anything to encourage family formation? The reality is that if you're a single parent, a, sing, a, a child of a single parent, and you grew up in a single parent family neighborhood, and you went to that single parent family school, the chance of you ever, ever reaching the top 20% of income earners is 3% in America. They don't have a shot. And we won't even have the courage to have leadership at the federal level, not with legislation, but the most powerful tool a president has the bully pulpit to encourage each and every one of you, churches and businesses and educators and community leaders, to let's have a national campaign to rebuild the American family. 
All right. So yeah. it, part of that question, uh, yeah. which, which was cut off, was I was pointing out that 40 yeah. percent of babies being born today, incredibly, are born to yeah. single moms. Yeah. Um, and that's six times as high as 1980, 11 times as high as in 1940. Yeah. And you wonder what's happening in society from an economic policy perspective that seems to be <clears throat> encouraging that. Well, I think it's a chicken and egg kind of thing. Hannity had a fellow on his show, a young fellow, said, I boasted, I fathered 30 babies by 24 different me me women. And so I'm saying to my fiscal conservative friends, maybe you ought to think about becoming more culturally conservative because who's going to pay child support for those 30 kids? And suddenly the fiscal conservative is going to say, hey, maybe I have a vested interest in getting on Santorum's bandwagon to how do we restructure our society and our culture. Our issues are not economic and they're not political. They're basically cultural and spiritual in our country. Uh, ben Carson said it so well the other day. No, but they, they can go hand in hand, I would say, Foster, yes, because there are do. things that we can do from a policy perspective that incentivize certain behaviors and disincentivize others. Right now, it seems as though we incentivize single motherhood. Well, you're absolutely right. However, I remember my grandfather, uh, a real strong German immigrant mm -hmm. guy, he said, I will starve before I take welfare. The incentives were there to do welfare. And so at one time when I was growing up, remember, envy used to be a sin. Yeah. Now envy is embedded in our very government and created the entitlement mindset. So it's a cultural, spiritual dimension in our country that we have to resuscitate that Judeo-Christian value. So look at Charleston, the shootings. Can you imagine how right the nation was stunned where all these people forgave this guy that shot nine of their relatives? What happened in Ferguson? What happened in, in, in the, uh, Baltimore? No, there's, there's, and, and you know, I think this is, is really uh, very much coming into focus. And, yeah. and your candidate, Sandra Santorum, <laughs> is part of that. It's good to have you here. Well, thank you, Chris. So it's a delight to be here. Thank you.